I once led confirmation class of sixth through eighth graders, and one of the classes we did or learned prayer stations, different kinds of praying. And the last station was the practice of confession and repentance. So with soft music playing and low lights, students surveyed their heart and answered the question, where do I need forgiveness? Who do I still need to forgive? They wrote uh, their answers on different pieces of paper and then put the papers in their hands and clutched them. Some of the students had very full hands. They held their debts and their regret regrets while we talked about repentance, which means literally turning 180 degrees from what they were doing towards the ways of God. It's the turning to lay our sins or others who've sinned against us into the gracious hands of God. So the students and I symbolize that. We turned around and we uh, put our different papers into a fire. And in the fire, we released them into the power of God where he did away with them. Then finally, we gathered around the altar to share communion, and I said these words. Having examined ourselves and repented of our sins, we come to this table with joy. For Christ has given his body and poured out his blood that our sins may be forgiven. And when Christ rose from the dead, we are assured that our sin was conquered. Taste the bread and juice and receive his grace this day. As I walked the students out to their car, I, I asked them, so what was your favorite station of all the stations? And 100% of them said confession. Because they said they felt lighter. Because they had unloaded their hearts and received God's grace, and they decided that they needed that. I don't think the students are alone. Our hearts and lives need that too, but somewhere along the line, we gave up the practice of confession and repentance. It used to be taught as part of our faith. It used to be a part of every Sunday. Maybe we stopped because we were part of a faith growing up that was full of do's and don'ts, and so we got tired of feeling bad. Maybe we stopped because we're afraid of what we'll find or feel there. Yet in my line of work, I found that we are all carrying some weight of debt or regret. In just this last month, there have been saints who've blurted out or murmured deep regrets, some that lasted more than 40 years, some holding the debt of wrongs done to them for over 60 years. There have been more conversations of debts and regrets than I have fingers and toes just this month. Because we all sin. We've overspent, we've overeaten, we've engaged in behavior that's not good for us or for others. We've lost our tempers. We've not been compassionate to see and respond to the needs of others or even ourselves. We've honored everything else in our lives above God, just to name a few of our sins and regrets? <clears throat> what about the anger and debt we hold against others for what they have done to us or not done with and for us? <clears throat> we are busy not talking to them or talking about them or retaliating or carrying that hurt. You and I carry unexamined, unrepentant sin. Debt and regret that is filling up our hearts and lives, but what if our hearts and lives were being filled up by the grace of Christ? That's what Christ has given us through this holy meal called communion. A meal for feasting on Christ's grace, the literal taste of Christ's grace for all that we carry. Imagine if we let that grace fill us. But before the meal, before the bread touches our tongue, before the juice touches our lips, we are to examine our hearts 
and confess and repent, a practice every time we take communion. We see something of this in, in Jesus' teaching this morning. It's from the, the Gospel of Matthew in, in, in what is called the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 through 7 of Matthew. It's Jesus' longest teaching, and, and we enter right where Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray. And he gets very direct. He says, listen, don't heap your prayer full of empty words. Just pray about these things. And then he gives us the Lord's Prayer, and right in the center, verses 11 and 12, uh, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. We're Methodists, so we say trespasses. As we also have forgiven our debtors. Forgiveness of debts and bread is tied together. Because Dr. John Kloppenborg explains the two most immediate problems facing the Galilean peasant, day laborer, and non-elite was bread and debt. So of course Jesus speaks right to their need, the point of their deepest need, and he begins to talk about it in spiritual terms. He talks about being forgiven debt and forgiving others of debt. It isn't a succession. It's not provisional. It's not, if you read the Greek, if you forgive others, then God will forgive you. The key word here is as. It's a both and, simultaneously. It's mutuality. It's about relationship. It's a radical understanding of our need to be forgiven by God and our need to forgive others. The Lord gives us the practice of examining ourselves in his prayer for us as we confess our need for grace. And then he ties it to the bread of grace, spiritual bread, the forgiveness and nourishment of grace. It's why Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Have you ever noticed how much time the Bible tells, tells us talking about Jesus' meals? It's like all the pictures of food on Instagram. <laughs> We're always talking about Jesus eating bread. We have the overflowing bread of the 5,000, Jesus eating with the Pharisees, Jesus eating with sinners like tax collectors, Jesus eating with friends. He's eating all the time because we begin to learn that in eating with Jesus, we share in his grace. And then on his last meal, the last supper, before he's condemned to die, there's another meal, a feast, where he takes the bread and says, this is my body, broken for you for you. And then he extends the invitation to keep eating this bread and taking part of the work of his broken body, which has historically meant, as in days of old, a holy sacrifice for the atonement of sins. And when Jesus, the Son of God, dies, he atones for the sins of all humanity. And then when he rises again, after his body was broken, he assures us that our sins are conquered and through him forgiveness offered. This bread and this cup that we take, we take it in joy because we are assured of the forgiveness of God. So first we examine ourselves and we confess our sins every time. Then we run, if we have to, to the table of grace to receive it through the bread and the cup. Now I want to be clear. The bread and the cup are not themselves grace. It is what has been ordained for us by Jesus Christ, the sharing of the bread in his name, that he's given us this as an avenue, a means of grace. So how does the bread and the cup become a means of grace? Because in his power we invite him, pour out your Holy Spirit on those gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine and make them be for us his body and blood, his grace. Then Christ goes about working through the bread and the cup as he promised he would do. So how does Christ work? Some believe that as Christ works through the bread and the cup, 
in sacraments, that the bread and the cup become the actual body and blood of Jesus. Our brothers and sisters who are Catholic generally hold that understanding. Some believe as, as Christ and his grace works through the bread and the cup, it remains bread and cup and also becomes, at the same time, body and blood, consubstantiation. Many of our Lutherans, brothers and sisters, hold that. Some believe that this is not a sacrament, it's not something God works through, but it is an ordinance, a, a, a requirement of faith, that when we take the bread and the cup, we remember, this is a remembrance of what Christ has done for us and his grace. But Methodists, we understand that Christ said, do this. Do this eating together in my name, and as you invite me to work through it, it is a sacrament, it is a holy mystery as Christ works, just as he did in his life, just as he did in his sacrifice, just as he does now, offering grace through the power of his spirit in sacrament. Author Sarah Miles felt that in her first communion. As an adult, she'd never heard the gospel, not once. She'd never been to church, not once. She'd never sung a hymn. And she had been through all kinds of pain and all kinds of grief, and was coming out on the other side and felt all kinds of gratitude. And so one Sunday, she meandered her way into a church called St. Gregory because she liked to look at the building and the way the light shined in. And at some point, she heard the minister say, all are welcome to this table, so this community took it around, took communion around the altar, and as she took communion, she said, and I quote, something outrageous happened to me. Jesus happened to me. It made no sense, end quote. She couldn't explain it. She said there were tears she couldn't control. Her body felt unbalanced. What she heard was, this is his body broken for you, but she tasted bread. What she heard was, this is his blood poured out for you, but she tasted wine. She reflected, quote, and what I knew at that moment was God named Christ or Jesus was real and in my mouth and it all left me to cry. It was realer than any thought of mine or any subjective emotion. It was as real as the taste of bread and wine and the word Jesus and his grace now lived in me. Because whether we can fully explain it or not, when we come to this table, we are given the grace of Jesus. It's his gift to us. We receive this bread of grace having first confessed our truth, that we are in need of grace. A grace that forgives us from God and a grace that helps us forgive others. Then we all joyfully come to this table and open our hands to the gift of saving grace as we hear once more his body broken for you, his blood poured out for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.